All my life, been grinding all my life Sacrifice, hustle paid the price Want a slice, got to roll the dice That's why, all my life, I've been grinding all my life It's time to grind! Hello everyone and welcome to the Grounded Podcast. I'm your host Randall Tucker. That was Nipsey Hussle bringing us in with his song Grinding All My Life. Let's hit that rail we call life and let's grind it. I want to start off today's podcast just to remind you if you haven't had a chance to uh, listen to the interviews that I did uh, with Donna Hawk who is the uh, worship leader at Partnership Christian Church, which is in my home church here in Maryville, out on Highway 321. You can go back and listen to that podcast. And, and also, uh, my brother, Greg Tucker, who is the pastor at uh, Faith Fellowship, a Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Lenore City, uh, listen to their podcast and their, and how they faced life challenges and, and how they overcame them. And share those podcasts with friends and family who are discouraged because our, our, our whole uh, goal here at Grind It is is to motivate one another, to love one another, to spur one another on to good good works, and to encourage people who are just down and out, who are just ready to give up. And we we want to exhort them and give them a, a gentle push of encouragement to keep going. You know, to endure to the end. That's what Jesus said. You know, we got to cross that finish line, and so that's what we want to do. We want to help each other to get up and to keep going. And to cross that finish line and keeping our eyes on Jesus. Um, and so we're going to get back into John chapter 3. And we're talking about Nicodemus who is a Pharisee. And he's having this discussion with Jesus about being born again. And, and this guy's thinking, you know, as smart as he is, he, he he's kind of ignorant here. He's thinking that he, he's got to enter back into his mom uh, and come out that birth canal again. And so Jesus tries to explain it to him a, a little bit. In uh, John chapter three verses thirteen to twenty one, and that's the verses that I ended last uh, podcast with. But I want to reread those because I want to bring something out. Jesus tells Nicodemus, he says, "No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven." And as Moses lifted up, now keep this in mind. This is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. He says, "As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up." So that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world. But to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world. But people love the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Now, thinking about Nicodemus and thinking how much he knew the Old Testament, I mean, this guy could quote it. And he would be so, and he taught as a Pharisee with the authority of Moses. And so, do you, do you see what Jesus does here with, with Nicodemus? He, he took someone that Nicodemus a, would, he would be very familiar with. He would highly respect this guy named Moses. And so, he shared a story about Moses lifting up a, a, a bronze snake on a pole. So that people wouldn't die from uh, from the snake bites. And Jesus said, just like those people looked at that snake that was lifted up on that pole, just just like they didn't die when they looked up on that snake, so shall it be for the people who look to the Son of Man who will be lifted up. Talking about him being on the cross. Now, if you were to go and read the the story of the snakes in, in Numbers 21, and I encourage you to do so, You will read where God was blessing his people from delivering them from their enemies left and right. And they're winning these wars. And he continued to feed them miraculously with manna from heaven as they marched toward the land of promise. But get this. The people grew impatient and started complaining, not only against Moses, but they also complained about God. Sound familiar? We do it today. We're no different. We lose our patience and we complain. 
God says, I've had enough. And so he, he sends poisonous snakes to the people. And when they bit the people, they died. And when this happened, they decided, that I better not mess with God anymore. And so they repent. And God's answer was for Moses to make a replica of, of one of the snakes and lift it high into the air on a pole. And when the people got bit, they could look at the snake on the pole and they would live. They, they, they didn't die. Well, think about this. Sin is poison. And Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, he says, For the wages of sin is death. Wages is something that we earn. It's something that you know, we get a paycheck. We get a wage for the work that we do. Well, we sin. We're all sinners. Romans 3.23 says we all sin and come short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, there is a wage that we, we get paid. And unfortunately, it's death. Death is separation. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, sin brings death, but God gives life. How? By looking to Jesus. John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, There is salvation in no one else. No one else. Salvation is only found in Jesus. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It's through Jesus. You can be religious all you want to. You can live the part. You can go to church, like I said in the last podcast, every time the doors is open. You can do all kinds of mission trips. You, you can go feed the homeless. You can go do all these wonderful things. But without Jesus... And a relationship with Jesus, you're just full of poison. You're going to die. Eternally separated from God. Don't look away. Look to Jesus. He is the only, and I stress, only antidote. And so John shifts his focus from Nicodemus back to John the Baptist in the second half of John chapter 3. And in this passage... There's a great illustration of how the enemy uses a plan of divide and conquer to destroy. He uses it to destroy us as individuals. He uses it to destroy us, our, our, our families, our churches, our businesses, our country. I mean, just take a look around. It's really evident in our country today. We're divided by color, by race, by genders, by political parties, by denominations. You Just fill in the blank. It's just division everywhere. This life matters. That life matters. I no longer identify by this, but I identify as that. Uh, You know, just all kinds of stuff. Division everywhere. Satan has divided us to the point that it's all become just like a bunch of static. Like when I was a kid, the cable would go off at midnight and all you would hear is... (laughs) Our country is so full of confusion... And confusion is not from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. God calls us to be unified, not divided. God wants unity, especially in the church. 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, United in thought and purpose. But church, we're just... I want to speak to Christians for a minute. We're, We're sometimes worse than the world. Because we can have... We can be sitting in our seat or we can be sitting in our pew on this side of the church building and we can't stand the brother or the sister that sits in the pew next to us, or behind us, or in front of us, or on the other side of the church. That's the vision. Jesus says a house that is divided cannot stand. It will not stand. 
You want to know why our churches are so weak and 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 they're closing their doors left and right? Oh, it, it might be because of COVID right now. But one of the reasons why our churches are so weak today is because of division. It's because of our our attitudes. It's because our heart is not right. We're now loving like Jesus loved. We don't love our neighbor. We can't stand him. We hold a grudge. You just wouldn't believe what brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so did to me 40 years ago. And I remember it like it was yesterday. That, that's not of God. Paul says, I appeal to you. Dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. What, you ain't even spoke to that brother or that sister in 30 or 40 years. That's not living in harmony. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Christian, if that is you today, please, Show some mercy and show some grace and go to that brother or sister and get this thing worked out. Not only for your soul's sake, but for the sake of the church. We want God to move. We want the Holy Spirit to have His way. But if there's division and there's sin, it's not going to happen. God wants unity. And John tells his readers that Jesus had left Jerusalem and went to the, to the uh, Judean countryside where he was baptizing people. Well, think about it. Who else is baptizing people? We already talked about him. John the Baptist. And remember, some of John's followers left John to go follow Jesus. And this is a recipe for disaster. Jealousy could easily creep in. Bitterness could easily take over. And it seems to be the case with some of John's followers. They didn't like Jesus trying to be like John the Baptist out there baptizing people. And so they go to John and they say, Look, man, this dude you met at the Jordan River, and he's baptizing people like you. And, and listen to this closely. Listen to what they say to John. We don't like this dude out there. He, this, he, he's, he's out there. He's, he, this guy you met at the Jordan River, he's baptizing people like you. And listen to this. Everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. Jealousy. Jealousy will ruin a person so fast. It will kill a relationship in a heartbeat. And here it is. We see it in what they say. Everybody's going to Jesus when they used to come to us. Jealousy is one of the greatest tools Satan uses to destroy us. We see it in our society. We see it in our country. We see it in our world. We see it in our jobs. We see it in our schools with our kids. We see it in our churches. And unfortunately... We even see it in our own homes. Let's take a break. Lost my board, fifth my shins. Trash. John the Baptist's disciples were, uh, it seems to me that they were allowing jealousy to creep in. They, 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 it seems to me when I read this, they didn't like the fact that people were no longer coming to them. They're, I mean, they're hearing crickets chirping. And everybody, they said, is going out to Jesus to be baptized. They, they just didn't like it. And they, they let John know it. And so I, I ended before the break saying that jealousy is one of the greatest tools that Satan uses to destroy us. And James chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, James write, writes, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. 
For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Let me read that again. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing and it is demonic, James says. That's pretty strong. John's disciples are not happy about what they hear. That Jesus is baptizing people and everybody's going out to him now and nobody's coming to them anymore. Think about it. Before Jesus started his ministry, John was out there looking like a caveman in the wilderness. He's eating bugs, locusts, and he's gone to to beehives and he's robbed honey and he's dipping these locusts in honey and people from all over the area was coming out to him to hear him speak about how the kingdom is arriving and the one who was coming that is mightier than he john you know even called jesus the lamb of god takes away the sins of the world and now all they hear is crickets chirping hardly Anyone, if anyone, is showing up to hear John's message anymore. It would be so easy to allow jealousy to take over. I mean, I, I play sports all my life, so I, I, I relate a lot of things to sports. And we, we see this jealousy thing just take over in sports all the time. You know, it's called ego, especially with people who are competitive. Oh, we have huge egos. And when people put us on a pedestal, we get our egos just get fed and they just our heads get bigger and bigger and our egos just grow and grow and grow. But when someone replaces us and we get kicked off our pedestal and we're no longer there and the, the eyes are no longer on us, they're on somebody else, our, our ego is it bursts. Our pride is hurt and jealousy takes over. I'm sure you see it happening all around you. You may see it at work. You may see it with your friends. It may be even happening to you. Maybe jealousy has creeped in your life. Maybe you're looking at other people and you have selfish ambition and you have jealousy in your heart. James says that's from that, that that's demonic. That's not from God. But John the Baptist, he squashes this immediately. In John chapter 3, verses 27 through 36, it says, John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you from the very beginning, I'm not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with the joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the Spirit without limit. The Father loves his Son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who does not obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. John the Baptist reminds his followers, his disciples, he reminds them that he told them from the very beginning that he was not the Messiah. It reminds me of that dinosaur, the baby dinosaur. He says, I'm not the mama. That was his, that was his famous saying. Not the mama. And this John the Baptist says, I'm, I'm not the Messiah. 
I told you that from the very beginning. I'm not the one. I was just preparing the way for the Messiah. And the Messiah is here. And it's time for him to take over. Uh, I believe the King James is the one that puts it. He must increase and I must decrease. So, I'm sure it was tough on John. I know it was tough on the disciples because they, they just put it out there. But John says, look, dude, I, I'm just here to prepare the way. And he's done his job, and it's time to turn it over to Jesus, who is the Messiah, the Christ, the one they've been looking for, the ones the Scriptures prophesy. Over 300 prophecies about the Messiah, the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. And Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. And with that in mind, about the prophecies of Jesus, Somebody, I don't remember who, you could Google it, I'm sure, and find out, but they they said just with having like 10 prophecies coming true about the Messiah and Jesus fulfilling, I think it's just 10, I think that's the right number. They said it'd be like going to the state of Texas and filling the state of Texas up with quarters, uh, which would be very hard today because we've got a coin shortage, but... You could go to the state, fill up the whole state of Texas, as big as Texas is, with quarters, knee deep. And take one of the quarters and paint one side of it black. And drop it in the whole state of Texas in a knee deep full of quarters. And reaching down and picking up that, that black quarter. It seems almost impossible. It's hard to even fathom that that would happen. The size of Texas, knee deep in quarters, and you can only pick one quarter. You think that's going to have the black marking on the back side of it? No. It ain't going to happen. But Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies. There is no doubt that Jesus was the one They've been looking for him for hundreds and hundreds of years. The Old Testament prophets prophesied about him over and over again. And Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy. And it's pretty cool. You should go, if you have a chance, just Google it. The prophecies about the Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled them. And you'll see all kind of charts where you have the Old Testament prophecies on one side and the New Testament scriptures on the other side where Jesus fulfilled them. John the Baptist has done his job, and it, he, it, it's time to give the keys to the kingdom, or give the keys to the car to Jesus. It's time for him to drive. Jesus, take the wheel, and he does. And so people are going to Jesus now, and they, they're, not, they're not coming to John anymore. And John the Baptist says, I am filled with joy at his success. Think about that. I am filled with joy at his success. Why can't we have that same attitude? Romans chapter 12, verse 15, the first part of that verse, Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice. Why do we not do that? Why why do we get angry? Why do we get upset? Why do we get jealous when we see someone have success, especially in the church? Well, why are they getting blessed? Why am I not getting blessed? Why did why did they get this? And I I don't uh, God didn't bless me like that. Why do we get angry? Why do we get upset? Why do we get jealous when we see someone have success? In my opinion here, here's why: because we're greedy and we're selfish. And we allow jealousy to creep in. And that's not from God. James says it's demonic, in fact. We covet what our neighbor has. And you know, God knew it was going to be a problem. A long time ago, when he, when Moses was up on Mount Sinai talking to God and getting those Ten Commandments, God knew it was going to be a problem. And so that's why he had Moses etch it out on those tablets. Thou shalt not covet. We covet what our neighbor has 
far too many times. You must not covet. You must not desire your neighbor's house, God says. You must not covet or you must not desire your neighbor's wife. You must not covet you must not desire male or female servants, ox or donkey. That, 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 that's valuable things back in those days when God was writing this. These things were like money, valuables. Don't covet, don't desire these things that your neighbor has. Don't desire anything else that belongs to your neighbor. God says. We should be content with what we have and yet we always want more. We call it keeping up with the Joneses. We look at what others have and instead of rejoicing with them at their success, we we covet, we desire what they have. And jealousy begins to creep in. Bitterness begins to creep in and James says, Jealousy is demonic. It's not from God. Be content. Get your eyes off your neighbor. Get your eyes on Jesus. Because when we look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, we see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We, we realize what He has done for us, the price that He has paid for us. And we are constantly reminded by the power of the Holy Spirit of what we have in Christ. And that we are all one. We are all unified. How? In Christ. And we grow each and every day, if we stay in the Word and we're looking to Jesus, we, we, we grow to be more like Jesus. And this, there's no room for jealousy and bitterness and envy and things like that. There's, there's no room to, to be coveting what other people have. Because we're looking to Jesus. And He is everything that we need. He has everything that we need. And John says, look guys, I, I, I understand your concerns. I know you're, you're upset because you know we, 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 we were, we had it going on. People were coming to us. You're right. We were baptizing all kinds of people out here you know, in, in the Jordan River. But, but our time's up. We've had our heyday. It's, it's, it's Jesus' turn now. I got to get out of the way. Matter of fact, you probably need to go follow him. Because what's going to happen is John the Baptist is put in prison and he's going to be beheaded. So he's going to be leaving the earth pretty soon here. But he says, and this is my words, he says, Look, guys, we're earthly. This guy's from heaven. The words that he speaks, they're from God. And he has the spirit without limit. We're, we're limited. We, we don't have the spirit with, without limit. We're, we're limited to what we can do. And our job is to tell about the, the coming kingdom and this Messiah. And, you know, I, I, I said I wasn't even worthy to, to stoop down and un, un, unlatch the, his sandals. And you know that that guy that you're talking about that's over there baptizing in the Judean countryside. He's the one you need to be following. He's the one you need to be listening to. Cuz he's the Messiah. He's sent from God. He is the one who takes away the sins of the world. I just pointed the way. And the way is now here. Sit back and enjoy the show. My question for you as we end this podcast is what are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to run to Him? 
You're going to run from him. Are you going to continue to hold on to your anger, your hurt, your envy, your jealousy, your bitterness? Are you going to continue to covet what everybody else has? Are you, are you going to continue to, 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 to not be content and desire for more? Or are you going to be satisfied with what you have, what God has blessed you with, and you're going to look to Jesus, and you're going to live for Jesus? Are you going to share Jesus with others? Because let's face it, let's be honest. When we take our last breath on this earth, what's going to matter? All the things we have acquired? No, they're going to stay behind. We can't take anything with us. When our heart beats for the last time and when we take that last breath, we're going to be in the presence of God. And Jesus is going to say, What what'd you do with me? God's going to say, What would you do with my son? Did you accept him? Did you live for him? Did you tell others about what he done for you? What are you going to say? Hey, the choice is yours. God bless. Thank you for listening to the Grind It Podcast today. You can send any questions or comments to grinditpodcast at gmail.com. Please join us next time. And when a challenge comes your way, just oh my, grind it. Been grinding all my life. Sacrifice. Hustle paid the price. Want a slice. Got to roll the dice. That's why. All my life. I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life.